Okay, so to begin, as always, I would like to first uh, take a moment to acknowledge the land that Keeler Tavern Museum sits upon. Um, so the town of Ridgefield exists on the ancestral homelands of the Ramapo, Muncie Lenape, and Wishkwaiskek people. They were the original stewards of this land on which the Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center stands today. And we thank them for their strength and resilience in stewarding this land. And we hope to continue to promote their legacy of protecting the site and its history. And I think acknowledging this land is important because as we'll find out, uh, sugar and rum um, have had a great effect on um, the, the human and physical face of the new world, of the Americas. Um, and so acknowledging what it was before uh, European uh, colonists arrived is, is important. Um, and uh, so from there, it's been a while since we did a demo, um, but I thought we would, would do one. Um, I did send uh, along with the Zoom link, a recipe for a rum punch, which is a very popular tavern drink. Um, as I will show later, Timothy was serving it here at the Keeler Tavern, um, or at least a punch. There were you know, thousands of punch recipes, but uh, I did send around a modified version um, and hopefully you'll get a chance to, uh, to try it, but I will make some right here uh, to enjoy with everyone. Um, I have my punch bowl here, which is the, the traditional way you would serve punch and it would be passed around to all the guests uh, at the tavern. So to begin with, I have uh, some sugar, about a tablespoon of sugar, in my punch bowl, and then I'm going to add some lemon. I have half a lemon here. And I did take the seeds out before I started, so <laughs> otherwise it would be a little lumpy. Um, and then I'm just gonna stir that up to dissolve the sugar. And then I have the all important ingredient, rum. Um, so I have about a little more than a quarter cup of rum. Um, if you're making this for two people, it would be three quarters of a cup, but I'm just one. And then I'm using tea tonight because it's a little chilly, so I want a warm punch. Um, but if you wanted a cold punch, you could use water and um, then serve it over ice. Or you could use iced tea, I suppose. Um, what kind of tea did you use for this? So I used uh, the buhi tea, so the traditional. Ah uh 18th century favorite um which is very strong so the lemon and sugar is gonna do a lot of work here um, bite it down but i'm gonna just mix all that together and then i have my rum punch to enjoy with everyone uh, as we discuss as it would have been done in in the tavern um so this is a, a drink to uh to discuss big topics around Revolution. <laughs> oh, those punch bowls. I love always telling the fourth graders when they would come in, you take it, you drink it, you pass it. Because they would always be like, well, where are the cups? And I was like, no, nah, this is a communal bowl. We're all going to get really familiar tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they'd always just be like, are you sure? And I went, yeah. Yeah. So uh, as you probably saw, there's two really important ingredients in this punch, uh, rum and sugar, which are the topic of tonight's uh, taproom tastings. And as always, I just want to remind everyone, if you have questions or curiosities, as we go, just type them in the chat and we'll try and answer uh, your questions. Um, so why don't we start with the origins of sugar? <laughs> I feel like every time we start with an origins, we're like, are you sure? Because I got a few different origins and I think you did too. Um, it's definitely a tropical or semi-tropical, I was going to say fruit, uh, but there were, I got a little conflicting of where it came from because I guess it depends on where you think it started. I think there was some that said um, South Pacific, sugar cane spreads to India and China in the Middle East, moves around, and it takes about 2,000 years. So I think 
I don't know, I, with every one of these ingredients, it's always hard to determine where they've come from, but because we can always track where they ended up. Um, but I think I heard New Guinea was one of them. The island of Java also came up, which was familiar because when we covered coffee, that was a big location of coffee beans as well. And I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> came from a little bit of everywhere. Yeah. The general consensus I found was like Southeast Asia, the Austronesian islands. Um, there were a couple of sugarcane species that kind of started to spread and then died out and, and something else took over. So sugarcane is a grass. It's like the uh. biggest grass. Um, and so the, the main species that's used that kind of persisted is um, originally from New Guinea is the kind of general consensus. Um, though there is a sugar cane from Taiwan that is still used in China and things like that, I think. Um, but like Mary said, from New Guinea, it went to India. And then the, um, the Muslims, the Mughals uh, kind of took it and spread it through Arabia. And then in the um, Islamic conquest of North Africa and Andalusia, it just spread um, throughout the Mediterranean. And then the Crusaders um, picked it up and they brought it back to, to Northwestern Europe. Um, and from that point, it just like took off because all of the kind of the books about sugar I read, they all start with the fact that humans love sweet things. And so it's kind of no wonder that everybody fell in love with sugar and started adding it to everything they could think of and trying to make a use for it in any way they could. Um, I know when we talk about different uh, food items, we often look at like how they were used medicinally and there's very specific, like it's a hot drink or a hot whatever or cold whatever and the humors and things like this. Sugar, um, I found could cure anything. Um, it was both hot both co and cold. It was dry and it was wet. And it was just because I think they just wanted to, to kind of come up with reasons to be able to eat sugar and prescribe sugar. And um, they had a medicine that finally tasted good. Exactly. Yeah. I, that's, I think it all comes down to it. when we've looked at any kind of medicinal product, it's always like rounded up, squished up, yucky, keep it cold, keep it. I don't know. It's just like, ugh, no, but all the sugar recipes for medicinal stuff were always like, oh yes, a spoonful of sugar should cover the bite of the taste. And I was like, oh, okay. So we finally kicked in that like medicine can be good for you and it can taste good too. Okay. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. through the medieval period, sugar was still very expensive and it was kind of strictly royalty only um, who could afford sugar because it was so tightly controlled by uh, the the Muslim um, and the, the Islamic empires. And so the, the Islamic empires kind of had started setting up sugar plantations around the, um, the Mediterranean, and as the Crusaders kind of conquered the Levant, they took over these, um, these plantations, uh, but they still didn't produce a whole lot of, of sugar. Um, so it was very expensive and it wasn't really until the, the quote unquote discovery of the Americas by the Europeans um, and the, the discovery that they could plant sugar in the Caribbean and um, that sugar really became an affordable option for most people. Um, but basically from the moment Europeans step foot in the Americas, they're bringing sugar. Um, Christopher Columbus was married to the daughter of a sugar planter, um, a Portuguese sugar planter. And so on his second voyage to Hispaniola, he brought sugar cane with him. Um, so, you know, sugar cane is kind of the, you know, very early on in, in American history. Um, 
And it's interesting when we were looking at how much was being traded even back and forth as early as the 17th century, like 1630, I found something that said Brazil was producing 45 million pounds of sugar, um, which was, I mean, that would supply most of the European demand because it's still very expensive at that point. 45 million pounds of sugar is coming out of Brazil in 1630. That, I mean, we're looking at sugar production today and looking at how it was produced, when it was produced, how you're shipping it is just an outrageous number to begin with. So when we say that this demand started very early, we mean almost it hit the ground running once it was planted and everybody was like, well, this is it. This is the new hot commodity that we're going to be committed to. And I mean, we still kind of are. Um, I was trying to find a food in my house that did not have any kind of sugar and uh, horrified to say the least. Uh, so yeah, when I read the 45 million pounds, I was expecting it to say something around the 1700s, maybe 1750, 1760. No, this is a hundred years prior. So when we were looking for statistics and numbers, anytime Catherine would give me a number or I would give her one, we'd be like, yeah, that's a lot of sugar. Too yeah. Much. Um, and, and sugar really drove uh, the colonization and the conflict in the Caribbean islands. Um, so the British were actually very late in getting to kind of the Caribbean. Um, so the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish had all kind of, um, the French had all kind of divvied up all of those islands. Um, and uh, so the British then came in and started conquering um, the the other colonizers to take over. So the British really don't um, get into the sugar uh, business until about 150 years after everyone else. So uh, the first known uh, European plantation in, in the colonies was 1501. The Portuguese established a plantation in Brazil and the British, their first plantation is in Barbados around 1640 or so um and and but once they get in there they are they kind of climb very quickly to the top of the the ladder um so craig asked why was sugar so successful in the americas versus the mediterranean uh that's a good question that i was not able to find a clear answer to um but i think it's um that the Caribbean, most of the Mediterranean sugar plantations were in the Levant, um, kind of uh, Eastern Mediterranean area, Jerusalem, um, Syria, uh, Lebanon, that area. And so it, it, it's a little bit drier there and sugar needs a lot of water. Um, and so the, the tropical, semi, subtropical um, uh, climate of the Caribbean islands and uh, the northern part of South America, the rainforest area, um, was much better for the sugar um, sugar cane. And sugar cane requires draws a lot of nutrients from the soil, and so at least in the beginning, there was very nutrient rich soil in those areas uh, versus the Mediterranean, where sugar had been grown for so much time and kind of depleted that soil. So. Um, so that's kind of why it's first started. Um, and so I actually found this really interesting graph about uh, sugar consumption and sugar prices uh, in Britain. Um, and you can see right when the British started developing their sugar plantations in Barbados is when you right. start seeing it like rise above that zero pounds per capita consumption. Um, and then it just takes off. Uh, so wow, yeah, and and then you can also see how the price drops precipitously around 1650. Um, so that by the time we're really into the 18th century, sugar is available and affordable to most people um, in Europe. And we'll talk a little bit about why not so much in the colonies. Um, but I thought this was a really interesting graph that shows kind of how 
we have this idea that sugar was just super expensive for so long and into the 18th century, but it turns out not to be not to be true. And sugar was such a big part of life in the 18th century, even if you're looking at the colonies or in England. I mean, we were talking about the reliance of sugar on tea and on tea culture when we had covered that topic and how important it was to have tea for tea, sugar for tea, sorry, <laughs> repeated myself. But even when we were looking at opulence of sugar structures and sugar forms, people were making molds out of sugar of just, because uh, it was such a form of wealth and opulence at the time that people were making these life-size uh, replicas of things, of animals, of food and people are trying to get sugar. And we were just like, that is a picture of a fake fruit basket made out of sugar. <laughs> yeah. And I think sugar and, and tea and coffee and chocolate are all entering European society all at the same time. And so they're kind of helping each other, right? I think sugar really did help tea and coffee get a foothold in European societies um, and chocolate too, because chocolate, you need sugar. Otherwise it's bitter. So I think without sugar, I don't know that those three beverages would have, would have been such a strong, um, we would have kind of taken over, um, society as they did. Um, so they really go hand in hand. Um, but we have all this sugar, they have this huge demand for sugar and we, Europeans have discovered that the Caribbean islands can support growing this sugar, but they need people to actually do the labor because sugar is a really labor intensive crop. Um, and so at first the colonists tried to use indigenous labor, um, but the diseases they brought and then also the the labor um, practices, uh, they soon found themselves needing more. And so the transatlantic slave trade kind of um, went hand in hand with sugar plantation growth as well. Um, so got another, got some really great, these are um, a set of photos. I only chose showed three, um, but there's it's a series of 10 uh, drawings from the island of Antigua uh, showing sugar production. Um, and so these kind of show the different steps that need to be taken um, through at the sugar plantations. So uh, in August and September, you start by planting the, the sugar cane. And um, what it is is basically the roots and like about six inches of the stems from the previous crop. Um, and they each have to be dug into a hole, two canes per hole. And then, as I mentioned, sugar cane requires a lot of nutrients. So then you put in 40 pounds of manure. And these um, enslaved uh, laborers were expected to do about 60 to 100 holes a day, um, which is essentially moving about 1,500 cubic feet of dirt uh, every day. And these plantations could be hundreds, even thousands of acres. Um, but once the sugarcane is planted, it actually doesn't require a whole lot of um, of maintenance. Uh, you do have to keep the rats out because uh, the rats like to chew on the, the sugar cane uh, and then uh, make sure that there's enough water. Um, but by the by the next March, um, the, sh the cane is ready to cut. And so they'll be cut about six inches from the ground so that you had that, um, that bit for next the next season. Uh, and then it needs to be processed within like two days. Um, so sugar cane needs to be processed within two days of harvest, otherwise the cane juice spoil. Um, and so what happens is you take the, the cut cane and it gets mashed up and rolled in these um, rollers and kind of crushed up and the juice uh, is 
filtered out uh, where it's then boiled. Um, and it is boiled in these vats. And you can see on the, the right hand uh, photo or picture there, um, that's the boiling house. And they're boiled in these vats and they need constant stirring. Um, so you have uh, gangs of enslaved laborers just constantly stirring in these stifling hot um, boiling houses uh, and risks of burns and um, everything like that. And this pro production goes on 24 hours a day uh, during the during harvest and production season. Um, so once the sugar is set boiling and the liquid is evaporating, uh, you get all sorts of impurities at the top um, that get skimmed off. And then uh, once it starts to just about crystallize this kind of syrup, uh, they add uh, quick lime, which tempers the acidity. And then it gets put into these cooling vats. And what you then have is essentially sugar crystals floating in molasses. And so as it cools, it gets stored into hogs, into barrels, these huge barrels uh, that are allowed to drain. And the, the, they're kind of, um, they have a filter at the bottom and the molasses drips out and the sugar remains. Um, and for the most part, uh, once you get into the 18th century, this unrefined, this kind of semi-processed sugar is what gets sent to uh, Europe and the Americas. And the refining happens in, um, in those cities. So Philadelphia and New York, London, um, Amsterdam was also a big uh, refinery, um, refining city. So that's kind of the first part of the sugar process. Um, and that all takes from planting to uh, that uh, raw sugar, uh, what's called muscovado sugar, uh, takes about 15 months. Labor intensive, and that's just a piece of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, it I I was under the assumption not fully, but I thought a lot of the work happened not on the mainland colonies. I thought most of it happened, and then I was like, yeah, New York has sugar houses, and I hadn't really made that full connection until we started looking in depth into all of this. And I I started looking into the sugar houses in New York because New York because it's New York and it's a commerce center becomes the center of sugar refineries during the 18th century. Um, I think I point, I'm going to point out a few of them. Um, we had the first New York refinery in 1730. I was able to find that New York Gazette article. Uh, Nicholas Baird opens the first one, obviously right by the water. So everything was coming into the harbor and moving along. Um, so the sugar that we were using in New York was able to, like Catherine said, really facilitate other industries, the confectionaries, the sugar, um, sugar shops, the sugar candy, um, coffee, tea, and all that other stuff. It really helped push it towards that next step that it needed to be used in another commodity or food. Um, so that was fun. And then most people associate, I think, I can say this as like a New York City historian, the Rhinelander Sugar House, because most people know that window that's in one police plaza. So if you've ever come to New York and a New York City tour guide takes you downtown, they'll point out that window that's in one police plaza. Rhinelander Sugar House was one of the oldest. It was one of the largest structures in 1763. It was six stories high. So this is as large as one of the churches. So when you were walking down the street, buildings were not supposed to be that tall. So this uh, is a good way to tell you how much sugar was being made. Um, Rhinelanders was taken over after the Revolutionary War. Um, I have the original name somewhere. Oh, so the original 1763 sugar house was owned by Henry Collier um, and the stone and brick structure was six stories tall. And this one stored sugar and molasses at the same time. So it was very, very large. And it was one of those relics that just did not get torn down for a really long time. I uh, made it till 1963 from 1763. So congratulations to New York City for not tearing down a structure. 
Um, you can see in the 1963 image, they kept one of the windows, which was, I thought was a nice homage to the original structure. Um, but the sugar houses were really large. They were usually around the water. You can bring things in. They would refine them. And depending on 18th or 19th century uh, refinery production technology, uh, I got really into the domino one. So I looked more into the 19th to 20th century refinery problems. Um, but it was really impressive. So during the Revolutionary War, you have these large structures and you have for the British occupying New York City. So they came in and they were usually used as multi-purpose spaces. You have the Sugar House prisons. Um, Rhinelanders was originally considered to be one, but depending on what historian you ask, they will tell you a different answer. I'm of the, uh, I don't think that it was a Sugar House prison. Uh, I just, I don't know. I'm inclined to say no, but if anybody has anything to like tell me otherwise, I'm always up for a new answer, um, but they would have been used for housing equipment. They were used sometimes to do uh, horse stalls, hospitals. I, I mean, honestly, the British came in and they were like, here's a standing structure. Let's just occupy it if it hasn't been burned down or torn down at that point in time. Um, but I really loved the fact that it was still standing in 1963, which was something that I had not realized myself. Um, and then we can probably talk about how sugar finished its life cycle in the sugar houses uh, using the demo that has Catherine, that the demo that is behind Catherine and the sugar cube loaf that is in this image over here. Um, I do have a question for the group though, because this is the one that plagued me the most is that every reference that I saw to a finished sugar loaf indicated blue paper and I don't I have an image of it this is from Townsend so you guys can buy sugar nippers and a sugar loaf for $75 off of Townsend and they again indicated the blue paper and I could not figure out for the life of me why they were using blue paper so if anybody has an answer that was the that was the the question that plagued me the most during this last couple of weeks of research for me but um you could, the loaves we learned came in different shapes and sizes. Uh, Catherine's demo repro one behind her is much larger, um, but usually the ones that we use are always made out of styrofoam. <laughs> yeah, so the, the iconic sugar cone, sugar loaf um, shape actually comes from this clarification process, the refining process. Um, which once the, the Muscovado sugar, this raw sugar is shipped from the Caribbean to wherever it's going, um, New York, uh, Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia was the largest sugar refining city in 18th century America. Um, it gets boiled again. Um, and this is where you get more of that molasses out. Um, and then you, it also gets mixed with lime, um, quick lime, and then either bull's blood, eggs white, egg whites, or bone ash. Um, usually animal, though there were reports of, especially on the Caribbean islands, of the, the bones of enslaved people being used for, for this as well. Um, so, yeah, um, that that was part of it. Um, so you mix all that in and you boil the this um, mixture is boiled and the proteins in the blood or the um, the the blood or the egg whites or whatever, they kind of coagulate around any impurities in the sugar and that flows to the top and it's skimmed off. And then once it's boiled down to another thick syrup, um, the sugar, it's allowed to crystallize and then it's fit into these cone-shaped molds. Um, and this is where that shape comes from. And this sugar, so this is a um, an etching from uh, the 16th, 15th century uh, England, um, but it does show kind of those cone-shaped molds, and the cones would actually be uh, set upside down so that all of the liquid gets filtered out the bottom of the cone, the, the pointy part of the cone, um, and 
what they would then do is you cover the top, the wide base of, of the sugar cone with a wet clay and you keep kind of sluicing water over it. And the water filters down through the sugar and pulls more molasses out um, until you get it as white as you want. And once it was white, you allowed it to dry, you unmolded it, and then it actually needed to be baked um, to fully dry out. And then you have your sugar cone and where it's wrapped in that blue, iconic blue paper. Um, I did read somewhere, that, and I don't know if this is from the 18th century or this is just modern people, you know, trying to um, justify or come up with a reason for that blue paper, but the blue of the paper makes the white of the sugar look whiter. So it might've been like a marketing thing. Um, but I, I did not find any um, uh, contemporary sources for that. It's um, gonna plague me, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so sugar loaves, um, that cone shape is, uh, probably the most iconic um, shape of sugar you could get. And then you had many different sizes. Uh, the larger the cone, the coarser the sugar it contained. So the really expensive, really fine stuff came in the smaller, um, smaller cones. They could be anywhere from like one pound for the really fine stuff um, to like four pound cones, uh, five pound cones for, for the coarse, uh, of course, sugar. Um, So I, one thing that I was able to discover in the New York City refineries, uh, one of the leading families was a very famous presidential family, were the Roosevelt's. The Roosevelt's originally dealt in sugar, um, and which is much farther than I usually study. So anytime I can find something that goes past like the Civil War, I'm like, I know it's embarrassing, but I'm usually just like, I don't know what's going on. So I was able to find the Roosevelt sugar connection. So we have Isaac Roosevelt on the, on the left um, and Cornelius C. Roosevelt, who I was still kind of looking for, but I think his name does pop up as well. So Isaac Roosevelt, um, I was able to find an advertisement for his sugar refinery business located on Queen Street at 159 um, and all the things that they did and Isaac Roosevelt's advertisement on the right as well. Um, but they were just kind of like little tiny slivers. I kept finding Roosevelt popping up and I was like, can that be? And I was able to source back that Cornelius C. Roosevelt opened a sugar house um, and he was the great, grand, great, great grandfather of Theodore and Isaac is the great, great grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So I have both Roosevelt's, not just one, but two. And they were all in the sugar refinery business in New York City, um, which I thought was just a nice light connection, sweet connection, if I may, to make that pun of like, we don't normally get to make presidential connections past 1812. So I was so happy to be able to find something like this <laughs> that I got really excited. Uh, I just wanted to share that. <laughs> oh. It's a screen before I lose you guys. There you are. Uh, yeah, no, I was like, so pumped about Finding a rose at all, yeah. I was kind of proud of myself. <laughs> we don't know. I don't normally go past like Jefferson sometimes. I just, you know, it's nice yeah, too. I know. Um, so we've kind of talked mostly about sugar, uh, which most of the um, Caribbean sugar produced was exported to Europe. Um, so a lot of sugar did not actually make it to the um, the North American colonies. What did come here instead was molasses. So molasses is kind of the waste product of um, sugar. It's what makes brown sugar brown. Um, and so these sugar islands were creating, you know, so much molasses. They had no idea what to do with it. Um, because it was a waste product. And initially they were um, mixing it with other things and feeding it to their livestock, feeding it to the enslaved people, 
Um, but as the amount of sugar production increased, the amount of molasses increased. So with 18th century methods, you get e a roughly either one part molasses to two parts sugar or three parts molasses to four parts sugar. So, you know, either half as much or, or three quarters as much, um, which is a lot considering that we're talking like millions of pounds of sugar produced every year. Um, and so the, uh, the Caribbean uh, sugar planters came up with this great idea. They were going to send all of their molasses to the North American colonies and let those people figure out what to do with it. And, and they did. did. <laughs> Um, so one of the things you, you, I noticed, um, especially in the cookbooks is that North American cookbooks have a lot more uses for molasses, uh, than cookbooks out of England, um, because of all of this molasses that's coming in. And so, uh, molasses was the primary sweetener used in the 13 colonies. Um, and so, oh, wow, why am I, um, and one of the main uses for molasses was actually to make like a small beer. Um, so you take yeast and water and mix it in with, uh, the, the molasses and let that ferment and it becomes like a, a low alcohol beer um, type thing. And then the other use for molasses besides regular cooking uh, was to make rum. So rum is pretty much, it's um, a truly American alcohol. Uh, it was first developed in uh, the sugar colonies as a way to to um, use up the the extra molasses. Um, and really the the way you make rum is you mix the molasses with water, add some yeast, let it ferment, and then distill that whole um, uh, concoction. and you get rum. And so the early rum was very bitter, um, not great. And it was commonly called Kill Devil. Um, so that was like the main name for, for rum uh, was Kill Devil. Either because it was the drink of the devil and would kill you if you drank too much, or it was so strong that it would kill the devil. Um, either option, I kind of came, saw both of those. Um, either way, early rum does not sound pleasant. <laughs> but they, they found a market for it. And so by the, the 1700s, nearly every sugar plantation also had a distillery. Um, and most rum out of the Caribbean was destined for Europe, uh, destined for England. Um, but uh, New England also developed uh, quite a rum industry as well. Um, so New England was importing a lot of molasses, um, mostly from foreign, um, foreign uh, nations, uh, the French and the Spanish uh, and the Dutch, um, because most of the English molasses in the Caribbean was being made into Caribbean rum that was sent to England. Um, but the French, decided that they were not going to allow any of their colonies to make rum because it would impact the French brandy um, industry. So all these French sugar islands had tons of molasses that they needed to figure out what to do with. Uh, and this became a problem because the colonies exist for the benefit of the mother country. And so, um, the New Englanders were getting all of this French molasses and then they were not supporting the British economy in that way. And so the British parliament uh, established the 1733 Molasses Act, supposedly to protect the British molasses trade, uh, but really to protect the British rum trade. <laughs> uh, but 
that did not stop New Englanders, and we just started smuggling the rum and the molasses instead. Um, I found a uh, a number. Um, <laughs> oh boy. I, I searched for numbers, like actual data for a long time. Uh, there hasn't been any that is like publicly available, not behind a paywall since like 1976. Um, but I did find some numbers uh, that were somebody published from uh, the Massachusetts Custom House. And it was in the 17, uh, where was it? Uh, in the 1750s, Massachusetts legally imported less than half as much molasses as they exported in rum. Um, so rum, you, one gallon of rum uses about one gallon of molasses. So it should be, if everything's legal, an equal amount. <laughs> but oh. they were importing less than half the amount of molasses needed to produce the exports in rum that they were they were doing. So there was a lot of smuggling going on. But and then I found weird smuggling amounts that were just input in academic papers with no citations as to where anybody got anything. So mine was that I found in 1763 out of 15,000 hog seeds of molasses that were imported to Massachusetts, 14,500 were smuggled in. So me and Catherine were going back and forth trying to like cross-reference our readings for about 20 minutes the other day going, where did you get this? Did you get this? Can we figure out the input from the export from the three different citations that we have from the molasses to the whiskey to the rum that was being made and trying to like circle back? I think the moral of the story is that A, paywalls are terrible. Um, and B, there is never going to be a true number because so much was being smuggled in and smuggled out um, that we just have guesstimates and maybe ledgers uh, that a lot of the estimates that we see today are based off of because the they, sugar and things like tea were being smuggled in. That's It's not like everything was on paper that you would see with like slave ships where everything was always dotted and accounted for. So we have that exact number. These smaller commodities were always kind of just going, okay, just bring them in on that tiny little rowboat into the corner and we won't tell anybody and it'll be fine. Um, so, yes. Uh, Craig wants to know what happened to the molasses smuggling during the French and Indian War. Kept going, didn't it? I that's... think, I mean, that's one of those smuggling questions that we have to deduce numbers that we have from I think it would just keep going I don't think it would have stopped them because that was still like a major thing because the molasses act eventually spirals and becomes the sugar act in 60 I always get these wrong because there were so many of them at the same exact time in 64 they all kind of like spiral into each other of like the mother country trying to regulate something that is not totally regulated because the sugar act and i remember doing this with education it wasn't just about sugar it's when you look at all of those intolerable acts it's never just the quartering act it's never just the tea act it's never just the townsend acts it's tea and like 16 other things that they've smuggled in there in like the fine print of a law because i did let me pull up the tea act these are just some of them. These are not all of them. Uh, you have indigo, foreign coffee, wine, other wine, except French wine, which always made me laugh. <laughs> Mixed silks or herbs manufactured in very specific places. Calicos that were dyed, printed, or stained in very specific places. Linen, French uh Lawn imported lawn. It's a, a cotton Thank fabric. You. It's like okay. a fine cotton. Yeah. It was like I copy and pasted this and I didn't write lawn. <laughs> Thank you. But it spirals into like 
everything else that you could possibly think of. Cause it's never just like, Oh, we want the molasses trade to be just for us. It was like, no, 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 no. They knew that they were losing money in a very specific way. And that's how they stopped or at least attempted to, because the sugar act had a lot more regulation when it came to how it was enforced. Um, I was able to find um, the existing tax system was so wildly inefficient because there was no way for them to reinforce it because I mean, as we've just pointed out, there was no way to find how much was being smuggled in or out at that time. One estimate I found was that for every, it costed the British government 8,000 pounds a year to collect 2,000 pounds in customs duties. Uh, So that's why when you see a sugar act or you see a stamp act and it has a bunch of different things in there, it was a blanket for, we know all of these things are coming in. We know that they're being smuggled in. Um, There are instances where uh, British Royal Navy ships are just kind of patrolling the waters very casually, allegedly. um, And they would go on and see these ships that would not have declared anything or had not yet had the opportunity to declare anything. And they would take those commodities. They would take those goods and then they would sell them for free. So it's like you have it on the ship's registry and it doesn't actually make it to land. And then you can't pay the duties or the import taxes on any of these things. And it's my arms disappearing as I'm holding my my brain. Um, Yeah, it's just this conversation that me and Catherine usually have around like numbers and trying to get good estimates to present to the public. Yeah. It's not frustrating at all. I know. Well, so the Molasses Act was like very famously not well regulated. Um, Pretty much nobody paid uh, the the duties uh, that the Molasses Act was supposed to uh, enforce. Um, So I think I found that in Massachusetts, In the 31 years the Molasses Act was in effect, they only collected 13,000 pounds over 31 years, um, which is not, it's pittance. Nothing, nothing. Um, So yeah, the Molasses Act was very, very famously terribly um, enforced. And so that's part of why the Sugar Act was put in place um, as a response to the French and Indian War. but yeah, war never stopped smuggling um, no. at all. And and there were the Spanish as well um, and the Dutch. The Dutch were, they very quickly relinquished their sugar colonies um, in the Caribbean and basically became the middlemen for everybody else. Um, so basically, if you wanted something, find a Dutch trader, they will get it for you, um, legally or not. Uh, they will find a way. Um, what a motto. <laughs> uh, so I said, Deanne asked, uh, when was the first recorded rum batch made? That's a very good question because there were like proto rums in uh, Brazil. Uh, and I did not write down the name of it, but it's still made today in Brazil. Um, and I can't remember the name of it, but traditionally like the traditionally accepted first uh rum came from Barbados um in 1650 something um and Barbados was a British uh colony and so uh yeah so that Barbados is kind of traditionally the first um rum producing island um, but then it spread everywhere, and uh, Jamaica became the by the the turn of the 18th century. Jamaica was the largest sugar and rum producing um, colony in the world. Um, I will say Staten Island was the first rum distillery in the colonies, or at least in New York. Um, and that's the only information that I can ever find on it. I can't find a name. I can't fair, find anywhere on Staten Island, where did it come from? But everybody's like, no, 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 no. It's a thing. And I'm like, we have to stop perpetuating these things on the internet if I can't have a citation to go with them because it's going to drive me nuts because I know that somewhere on Staten Island, there's a plaque to it. I just can't find it. Yeah. Um, (laughs) 
Um, but mm -hmm. rum, New England, New England rum did become um, pretty. So New England rum uh, had a reputation as being uh, of poorer quality than uh, Caribbean rum. Uh, however, it was half to two thirds as expensive as Caribbean rum. So it was significantly cheaper. Um, and Massachusetts and Rhode Island were the main um, distillery, dis the kind of centers of distilling, though all New England colonies had uh, distilleries. Um, I found that 1750, I think Connecticut had five distilleries. Uh, almost none of the rum was being exported, so it was all for, you know, domestic use. Um, but the thing about rum is setting up a rum distillery actually is kind of expensive. You need, um, the pot stills are like very specific. Um, one of the reasons New England was good for developing a rum distilling culture is because there was lots of wood. Um, there was a cooper uh, cooperage industry, as well as a metalworking industry. Um, so that was all there kind of in preparation for rum to take off. Um, but, but rum, New England rum was also kind of, uh, used as part of the, the triangular trade. So I know in school, we always talk about rum, New England rum goes to Africa, uh, where it's traded for African slaves who are then taken to the Caribbean to work the sugar plantations. And then the molasses goes up to New England. Um, so that is a very simplified uh, thing about what's happening, uh, but it's not, it, it is true that rum, New England rum was being traded in Africa. How much of it and what, its importance in that trade is um, not quite sure. Again, the only concrete numbers I could find are from 1956. Um, after that, anything I could find is just like, they were trading rum. And, um, but I did find some references that said the rum, while a trade good in Africa was actually less um, valuable than some of the other things like uh, guns and uh, ammunition and textiles and things like that. Um, but of the the um, not insignificant number of slave voyages out of New England, most of that cargo was rum that was being traded. Um, so it is, uh, if you've ever seen the movie or the, the play 1776, there's a great song, Molasses, uh, to, Molasses to Rum to Slaves, um, which I listen like on repeat as I'm researching. <laughs> it's a great song. The um, original Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great show. Oh, and, and, um, so we've got a few minutes left. Uh, and so... I realized I did not talk about Timothy Keeler. We've talked about uh -oh. lots, um, lots about the colonies in general, but uh, Timothy, as a tavern keeper and a store owner, does deal a lot with rum and molasses and sugar. So I had all of them, <laughs> um, which is not usual. Um, so here, the first thing I found were um, bills of sale. So these are Timothy going to New York City to purchase inventory for his store. And so here we have a couple um, he's buying from or through, we're not really sure, um, but Isaac and Andrew Koch, uh, who are in New York City. And he's buying sugar in a couple of different forms. So he has here two lo loaves of sugar. Uh, at 16 pounds, 12 ounces. And then on the other uh, sale, bill of sale, he's buying uh, four lumps of sugar at 41 pounds, uh, 41 pounds, two ounces. So lumps are basically just like not cone shaped loaves. They're just like giant clumps of sugar. Um, and then at the bottom of this bill here, he also buys one barrel of sugar. Um, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what this measurement system here. He has 2.1.3. I think it has something to do with the way you 
divide up barrels and hogsheads and things like that. Um, I haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what kind of sugar is in a barrel. I think it's probably Muscovado sugar, that unrefined sugar. Um, because later on when he's selling sugar, he does sell something called molasses sugar, which I, is, sounds to me like it's uh, Muscovado sugar. Um, but yeah, so these are from the store day books. Um, so this is where he's then selling it out of the store and he sells um, to E. Slauson. Uh, he sells both loaf sugar and just plain sugar. Um, and then he's also selling here in 1788, he sells molasses sugar. Um, so my feeling, I couldn't find a for sure definition molasses sugar, but I do think it's that Muscovado sugar. It's got molasses still mixed in with it. Um, so sugar is coming in and out of the store here. Uh, the people of Ridgefield do like a lot of sugar. Um, Good. Just about every person who comes, came to the store at least once bought sugar. Um, and these are good amounts of sugar that they're purchasing at once. It's not like they're coming in for like tiny little amounts. I mean, oh, these are, yeah, yeah. These these are, are good like, chunks. Yeah. These are yeah. like so a he, pound of sugar, two pounds. Yeah. Here's 12 pounds of molasses sugar. Um, that's a lot, <laughs> a lot of sugar. <laughs> Um, and then here are, is rum. So not only sugar, but Timothy is purchasing rum. Um, and one of the things that I did find out is after the revolution, rum consumption in all 13 colonies kind of went down uh, because rum was seen as being like British and so therefore unpatriotic. Um, and so that led to the rise of the whis of whiskey as the drink of America. Um, but I, in Ridgefield, it did not seem to go down that much. Um, <laughs> but you can see the price of rum kind of varies. It goes up and down all in the, the decades after the revolution. Um, so you can see here in 1789, uh, one hogshead of rum, uh, Timothy's buying it for at uh, four shillings, nine pence per gallon. Uh, by the time in 1791, it's up to five pounds or five shillings per gallon. And then um, in 1792, it's now five shillings, three pence per gallon. Um, so it is going up. Uh, it's costing Timothy more to buy uh, his rum. So it's going to cost him more to sell it as well. Um, and then he also buys molasses. He doesn't buy a lot of molasses. Um, I found at least in the records we have not enough to cover what he's then selling to people. Um, but, uh, I did want to show this ledger page where Jonathan, um, Ingersoll, I believe, uh, he's buying a lot of rum. Uh, it's like every two days he's in to get another pint or another, you know, quart of rum. Um, he also has cherry rum, um, which Ooh. I can't figure out if it's just cherry. It's like, you know, rum with cherry juice or cherry flavoring, or if it's a drink called cherry bounce, um, which was like a mixed drink with rum and cherry flavoring and vinegar and sugar. It was like a, a kind of a mixed drink. Um, so I can't figure that out because when I search cherry rum, it either gives me modern day cherry flavored rums or it gives me Martha Washington's recipe for cherry bounce, um, which is made with brandy. So I don't know. Um, but Jonathan here also, I started, he also gets a bowl of punch. Um, so we do know Timothy was was uh, selling punch at his um, his tavern as well. Um, and Jonathan buys, he buys a whole hogshead of molasses at oh one goodness. point, which is a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. So I did say that 
you know, after the revolution, rum supposedly went down, rum consumption went down. Um, according to Timothy's records, a little bit, um, I did manage to find two sets of data from the exact same dates in two different years. Um, so in 1774, in the period November 11th to the 25th, uh, Timothy sold 17 gallons of rum in 17 transactions, which means most people were buying one gallon of rum. Um, and he was selling it at five shillings, six pence. In 1788, he sold 15 gallons of rum. However, across, that was across 31 transactions. So most people were buying one pint of rum, uh, which is an eighth of a gallon. Uh, Per transaction. And the price per gallon went down to four shillings, six pence. Um, and then lastly, these are actually, this is Timothy's records of him buying for himself, and they got really blurry. Um, but essentially, as I said, the price of rum started like varying wildly. Um, so in 1790, again, it was five shillings, six pence. But by 1792, Timothy was selling rum at eight shillings a gallon, um, which is like double what it was uh, just a few years ago. So it's a. Uh... I would love to see an analysis of <laughs> liquor sold at the tavern and just like compare the years to see where the taste buds were in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, so I do want to preview one of the things I am getting set up is. Um, some transcription opportunities for these ledgers. Um, this will be a project that folks will be able to do from home over the computer. So if anyone's interested, keep an eye out. Um, we'll be announcing that soon, um, kind of yeah. finalizing some of the things. So if you want to kind of dig deeper into the ledgers, that'll be an opportunity to do that. Um, oh, and that's more sugar consumption. It no. just goes up, folks. It just goes <laughs> up. I that's how we should, it just, it just keeps going up. Uh, I looked at reports from the 19th and 20th century into the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. And it just, it never goes down. Even through our eight, mid 18th, uh, mid 19th century health revival times that we've spoken about in the past, it doesn't go down. <laughs> people just like sugar and there's more people. Yeah. And uh, the um, Americans started being, once uh, we bought Louisiana, uh, America was able to produce her own sugar. Um, and then of course in Hawaii as well. Um, so, uh, so yeah, pretty soon after uh, the American revolution, we do start having domestic sugar production. Uh, and there's still a lot of refineries today. Uh, in America, producing a lot of the sugar um, that we consume, and we consume a lot of it. Um, however, uh, cane sugar does not feature so much in our diets anymore, um, at least in, in America. And I know early on, um, I think someone asked about sugar beets. Um, and sugar beets, which makes up about 50% of American sugar. Um, it's just, it's a in the beet family um, and you process it pretty much the same way you do sugar cane, um, but it was cultivated and um, made widely available in uh, the 19th century. Um, and it started in Prussia, Frederick the Great of Prussia, uh, subsidized experiments on sugar beets. And then it spread, um, I think I read somewhere Russia, the U.S., and Germany are like the top three sugar beet producing uh, nations. Um, and yeah, that makes up about 50% of all our sugar. So it's different ecosystems. Yes. Yeah, so sugar beets are, are in temperate, yeah. uh, temperate zones. Um, so it's a completely kind of different climate. Um, and, and then Craig asked, do we know if the average subsistence farmer could afford rum, uh, sugar in the 1790s or rum? Uh, yes, sugar was pretty affordable. Um, less so in the colonies because most of the sugar, there was a little coming into New York and, and Philadelphia, um, but most of the sugar that was 
you know, available for purchase in the colonies had to be routed through England. Um, so that's part of the reason why molasses just remained uh, the main sweetener in the colonies. Uh, but rum for sure, especially domestic rum, um, you know, especially, and domestic rum could be wildly different qualities. So you have a wild, a different range. So depends on how, uh, how picky your, your taste buds are um, <laughs> from that point of view. But yeah, rum was, I think, um, I found somebody estimated that on the eve of the American Revolution, the average uh, colonist was drinking three, um, was it three imperial gallons of rum a year or something like that, which is still a lot. Um, so, yeah, a lot of rum, um, which is part of the reason rum also features in a lot of the different drinks seen at taverns. Um, there was a Swedish traveler who recorded 45 different like mixed drinks he found at taverns in the colonies. And I think 18 of them were rum based, um, which is a significant number. And they have great names like Calabogus and Mimbo and Bumbo and things like that. So that's fun. <laughs> All right. So we are at the end of our hour. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed learning a little bit about sugar and rum. And understood where your sweet tooth comes from. <laughs> Still a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, this was more interesting than I thought it was going to be. And I learned a lot more than I thought that I knew, which is really good. I like doing things. Yeah, it was for sure a lot more complex than I initially, I came into this um, thinking. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you get a chance to try the, the rum punch. Uh, and um, I hope you'll join us next month, uh, April 11th. Uh, second Tuesday in April. Uh, I think it's the 11th. And we will be it's actually talking about historic cookbooks. So Mary and my, like our first thing we do when we start research is go to the cookbooks. Um, so we'll be talking a lot about those um, and what we can find out about uh, 18th century society through the cookbooks. So I hope you'll join so us. Much. Um, hope you'll join us and have a great evening, everyone. Stay warm and hope the snow's not too bad where you are. <laughs> Good night, everybody.